Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Doug. I'm an alcoholic. By the grace of God, the Fellowship Alcoholics Anonymous, folks like I'm looking at in this room, including a lot of the folks that are in this room, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink since March the 15th, 1994. And for that, I'm awful grateful. Um, thank you, Chris, um, for um, asking me this afternoon to, uh, to uh, speak. My first thought when you asked me to speak was... Bob and Jerry and I came in town, and I met them in town on Thursday. Bob shared at uh, Sandy's meeting, and we, t- we, and we talked Thursday night, said, and I said how uncomfortable it would be if I ever had to stand in front of a podium at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous without having a shirt and tie on. <laughs> so, Sandy, first off, I want to thank you for telling us at the very beginning that this was not an AA meeting, there is no AA meeting, there are no AA books, this is just a group of men who happen to be sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous so I can rationalize my behavior. <laughs> the other thing that uh, stuck in my mind, the very second thought was that I, uh, I, I, am, I'm a, I travel a lot for work by car, and, and so I'm a CD listener, and I wore out a CD of my, uh, of my new uh, uh, grand sponsor who, who has a talk that I've had in my car for years, and the talk is in AA, traditionally we dot, 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 and he talks about things that he does in his life, and he talked about wearing a tie, and wearing a, uh, a, a shirt with a collar at his meeting and whenever he's at a podium. And that was the second thought that I had because I can rationalize my behavior because I really don't need to look like a jerk in front of my new grand sponsor the first time I stood up here on, uh, intentionally. And then when uh, Chris, you said that um, Sandy had asked and threw my name in Sandy, I really think it's the fact that um, um, I'm grateful for it because I was here in the first the first time, and and as the um, one of the last people to be able to come on this trip, it's pretty cool to be here, um, and it was fun, and it made me th- it made me feel good to be able to go back in that book and look at the pictures of us playing golf together. And by the way, they still owe us a coke, Sandy. In case I don't want to forget that. And then the other thought that I had is I told my wife last night, you know, and I'd called her up to do uh, say good night to her, and told her about some of the folks that were here today. And because uh, I have a lot of friends in this room, I have a lot of teachers in this room. Okay, I have a sponsor, a backup sponsor, some friends, somebody who invited me to something in his life yesterday. It was too fancy of a words to talk about. When I told her, when I told Nancy that we were going to have uh, three, three, four hours of silence today, she told me that I had to stay away from Steve <laughs> because there's no way that we're not wouldn't spend three or four hours trying to get each other to laugh out loud. But I judge no one. Um, and Martin, thanks for around the campfire. You already talked what I had to talk about about spiritual experience. We don't know when we're living in it. The folks that are really having their experience are the folks that made this all possible for us. Amy, Dave, Chris, Chris, Peter. I think I got all of you. Guy, the C- I forgot the CEO. And Sandy, you folks made it possible, and you're having the experience for us, and that's part of it. I actually had a conversation because I had an issue going on in my life uh, when we were leaving here uh, six years ago, and it had to do with, you know, an AA deal and an event deal and some problems and some personalities, and I was uh, looking for some wisdom from Bob on the thing, and he told me at that point that I'd become an old-timer, and I sure didn't feel like it, you know. So, um, because on March the 15th, 1994, um, I pulled into a, um, a treatment center to be dropped off at a treatment center. I poured my uh, the ice cubes in my last drink on the curb at the treatment center, walked in the treatment center on about a five-day run, where I had been a five-day drunk, sloppy best man at my best friend's wedding. Um, got into a tremendous argument with my wife at the admission center of that treatment facility because I told her the only things she really cared about were her Gal, gal darn frequent flyer miles, because she uh, uh, we had no insurance to cover it, and um, I had spent the weekend before 
um, with a group of 15 or 20 men in Las Vegas uh, as the best man at that guy's wedding. And I charged everything on one of the cards and spent all that cash and ran up the credit lines at a couple other casinos and spent all that. And she was scrambling around trying to free up some funds to, to uh, get my butt put away in there, okay? And, uh, and the only other thing that I could remember from my whole experience in that was I proudly wrote under religious affiliation agnostic. I hadn't had a relationship with anyone other than myself for many, many years. You know, uh, um, for a long, long time, I didn't care. I hadn't been to a church in many, many years except for some weddings. I didn't do funerals. And I uh, hadn't been to a church since the day I got confirmed, you know, when I was 13 years old. And I grew up in a home that that just the way that it was. Everyone else that was above me in the home had to stay and in, stay and in, in go into church till uh, they uh, graduated from high school. But I was a special case, and acted like it. Um, you know, my mother was a deacon of the church. She was a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Passed away um, a year and a half ago, uh, with 43 years of sobriety. So I grew up with folks like you in my home, and I didn't like you then. When I was at March the 15th, 1994, I don't think I liked you then either. <laughs> And I had no concept. And until sometime then of March of 1994, I never identified myself as an alcoholic. You know, all I was doing was do a little drinking. I'd been in a treatment center one time before, and it was just the co- and I thought it was just the cocaine. It had nothing to do with the fact that there was alcohol before, during, and afterwards. I just didn't relate. And all the issues that I had in my life had nothing to do with it. And my life started to turn around, and my options started getting a little, little, little less and a little less and a little less. And I agreed to go to that treatment center to go hide out. Because until I could figure out a new plan to get people off my back to be able to get going, after I was the best man, after I was the best man in that guy's wedding, and I'm also going to be grateful for that month of experience because something happened to me. I had my first spiritual experience, and the first spiritual experience I had was about three weeks into it. After I saw people coming and going and kicking and screaming and not being happy and being told to do stuff, and they gave me a roommate after I'd had a room alone for a week, and the roommate was built sort of like I was. He was tall. He was thin. He crossed his arms and he tilted his head to the side. And he was about 30 years older than I was. And he was in really, really, really rough shape. He was in rough enough shape that that I went to the nurse and I said, this guy doesn't belong in the unit. He can't control any of his bodily functions. She checked his vitals, said, Mr. Hall, his vitals are fine. If he can't control any of his bodily functions and and he's your roommate, looks like you have problems, not me. But here's what happened to me that night. I stayed up that night, more out of fear of getting puke on me than anything else probably, but I stayed up. And I'm a lazy person who likes to sleep eight or ten hours a night. The other thing I might have a resentment for you about, Chris, you were right, you did ruin my meditation. I did not get a nap in today. Uh, But, um, um, and while I was up that night, I was able to somehow late at that night, you know, be able to take um, the first three steps of recovery in my life and start my journey. And I haven't had a chance to have to look back for many of those cases since then. You know, there, I, I saw that night before I, before I had the first reading that I, uh, that I can recall. I opened up my book. You know, I, I saw a vision for you in me and that man 30 years from now, and I didn't like it. So while I was up that night, I opened up my big book, and I turned to page 64, and it says, Our liquor is but a symptom. And it made me go, huh. And I thought, and by the end of that night, I was going to do whatever they said the next morning and follow any direction that they wanted to, uh, that they were going to give me. And that first step, we admitted, you know, was a real simple question. How do you like the way you've been living your life, Doug? And that second step made a decision. It's another simple question to me. Do I think, am I willing to accept that somebody else has ever been able to have a better way of living their life than I've been able to figure out how to live my life? Then that third step and make a decision. You know, was I going to be willing to respect this disease today, first and foremost? And I was. And here's the, here's the spiritual, you know, if I'm sharing my spiritual experience with you folks tonight, here's my spiritual vision. I had one that night. And it was Popeye, Popeye the Sailor Man. Everyone here knows who Popeye the Sailor Man is. And, and, and he popped in my head, you know, before dawn that night. And, it, and what it was is when he said, I am what I am. I am what I am. I own this thing of being an alcoholic for the first time in my life. I am what I am. And it was okay. It felt okay. So they told me I'd find my answers in meetings to Alcoholics Anonymous. So go forth and, you know, and get out there. Get a sponsor, read the big book, work the steps, get involved. You know? And it didn't take very long before my thinking started kicking back in. I didn't like you. I didn't like the time. I didn't like the place. And things started happening. But I didn't. And I was really getting uncomfortable in my skin. 
you know, but I started hanging around meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous enough to start seeing the wonder of Alcoholics Anonymous happen in your lives. I started seeing you getting back together with your wife. I started seeing you going back to school. I started seeing you with the spark on the laughter in the eye. And the only yous that had that were the folks that had taken these actions in their lives. And then one day, after I was sober a few months, you know, something happened in my home group. And where I come from in Minnesota, most of our meetings are step meetings. You know, somebody takes the lead on a step for five or ten minutes. We break into small groups, share our experience and whatever, and uh, move on. And my, meet, my home group's a, a step meeting, and we sign up on a clipboard. And the clipboard usually ends up back there in the locker, but for some reason it ended up on my small group table. And that uh, small group table uh, had, uh, the, uh, for the next 26 weeks, a couple weeks out, there was an eighth step. A uh, spot that somebody had taken the eraser, crossed his name out because he couldn't make it. He was out of town and it ended up there. And I remembered after the meeting somebody talking about to another guy how the, his life had changed all those years before when he took that eight step in his life after he'd gotten out of treatment and gotten in the game. And I saw it there and I signed and I put my name on the list and because I have a big enough ego, I knew I had to do the work before I want to talk about it. And I'm just sitting here to say that, that my life changed. I can tell the date, the time, the place I took that eight step. I wrote that eight step. I can pretty much tell you how long it took. And I think of anything I've done in my life, anything I've done in my life, that day that I wrote that eight step list was the most spiritual actions that I've ever taken in my life. Because it was the first time that I could ever actually sit and think about, you know, where could I have been a better husband? Where could I have been a better, if I could think your name, where could I have been a better friend? How could I have shown up better uh, as a sponsee or as, a, as an employee or as a home group member? How could I have shown up more lovingly and thoughtfully as opposed to um, staying at home? I went out of town that week, that weekend, with my wife. We had been married for at least a dozen years at that time. And uh, we were, it was before we all carried cell phones, obviously, and the phone rang in the hotel room we were at. She was in the other room. The phone, for, you know, she came into, uh, she came into uh, the uh, other room where I was at. She had a piece of legal paper in her hand like this. It was full of, it was full of women's names. And she said to me, I'm sorry. I reached into your briefcase to grab a piece of paper to write, your, to write a message down for you, and I saw this. Could have stuck it back in my briefcase, you, you know, and not, and not be the wiser of it, but, you know, I'm trying to live my life on principle it means, too. I just want to let you know that, you know, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to take it. And, um, oh, by the way, what Doug heard, oh, by the way, when are we going to have the talk? No, I had had a couple of breakfast meetings with uh, Bob over the couple months before. He had been one of those people that had been in and out of my parents' house all those years before, and he had just called me up and, and, and said, uh, I'm a businessman from St. Paul. We have some mutual friends in common. You know, uh, you wanted me for, for uh, breakfast. And we uh, met for breakfast a couple of times, talked, and I asked him one time about the sponsor thing, and he said, and he kind of told me what, you know, the sponsorship thing's all about. And uh, that was the first weekend that I uh, called Bob, and my pants were on fire. You know, what do I do? You know, how am I going to go about this? And she and he said to me, well, you got a lot of options in front of yourself. You know, you can have the conversation with her. You're slick enough, you could probably pull it off. You know, he said, heck, you know, if you want to have a conversation with me, I'll come over and buy you coffee and we can do it together. My wife sponsors your wife and Alan on We could go out for dinner and do it. You know, and, 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 and he, was, he, was, he was laying out the, the options to me until I asked a question, you know, and asked for the, some guidance. And I suggested what, what, what he would think he would, he would have me do. And he said, you know, if you're really trying to live this life that we talk about in this principled life and try to treat your wife with the dignity and respect that uh, she deserves, you know, why don't you try to act like it instead of talking like it? It might not be the easiest way out, but it might be the... Um, it might be a smart move for you to try. So I'm just here to stand in here 18 years later to tell each and every one of you I've never had the conversation with my wife. Now, a day hasn't gone by, including coming to tonight's meeting when I texted her, you know, where I, where I, where I don't take the time to tell, you, tell her I love you. 
Most days I can act, uh, that's not, I'll, this is, I need to be honest here. Some days I can actually pick up the phone and call her and ask her about how I could be of service to her today. You know, and try to do my part. And, and it's moved on a long time. And my life changed through the process of taking the action and, and knocking down the ninth step uh, with the other people in my life and the important ones that we shared about and how to do it. And people want to talk about what the spiritual experience is really all about. It's taking those actions, you know, one at a time and knocking them down and finishing them off. And how my life really changed from it. Um, I started getting involved with members of, uh, of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and stuff because of, because of, uh, yeah. And one of the gifts that I'm going to tell you about the, about having that conversation with my wife and the way my life has changed through it is um, my closest friends in Alcoholics Anonymous today and the ones that, um, that call me up when they're in trouble or their babies are in trouble or they need something done or women because through that process of, uh, of, uh, of working those uh, working those amends and developing the relationship that I need with her, I've become the safe guy. I've become the guy in, in my in people's life who says, who say, I have a, I have a, a baby who's uh, who this guy in that meeting is 13 step, and would you go have a talk with him? Okay. Um, I have uh, somebody who says, I need a male to do this. Would you come have a talk? You know, would you come uh, uh, be involved in this thing? You know, I need somebody to, uh, to have my back at an, AA, at an AA meeting where they have, uh, where they give me feedback. And I'm scared, would you come with me? You know, the kinds of things that we can only generate from having relationships with people that are really based on love and honor and the spiritual experience of action, of working together. Because that's what this thing's all about. I thought I was the same person for all these years inside my skin. Some days I really think I am. And I know my life has changed, and I don't know how or why. And one of the last things that, that, uh, that, our, that Bill wrote about in, in the grapevine was if you can define what a spiritual experience is, ain't got it. If you think you got it, you ain't got it. It's all about, it's all about the, uh, the uh, journey of moving forward towards it. And I still don't know how it is. And one of the great gifts that Bobby gave me through it is he threw, is I was asked to participate in a spiritual advisory board of a of a uh, of a, uh, a treatment center he was involved in. He threw my name in the list, and I'm sitting at this breakfast meeting with a group of people, and uh, and I called him up and said, "They told me you inv- you uh, put my name in for this thing. Why would you do that?" He took a deep breath and he said, "Doug." <sighs> Your right and wrong buttons in a, in a, is usually in the right spot. So when we went around the room, and everyone else in the, everyone else in the room had at least 10 years more experience than I did, and they asked the question, "What gives you the right to sit at this table?" Is the way that I heard. You know, give me your, you know, tell me your AA, you know, bona fides to do this. And I said, "Hell, I don't know." My sponsor said, "My right and wrong buttons in the right spot. He'll do just fine." Because that's all, that's what it's really all about, isn't it? I mean, sometime between all of us sitting here together, having an issue, working together through the group's conscience, where you have the opportunity of having the conversation about in those business meetings what they call the minority opinion. But through the, through the group's efforts, we're going to get to the right, we're going to get to the right spot and the right way to get it done. We need to journey outside of ourselves to do so. I want you to know that I can do a fair amount of reading, and I'm a fairly bright guy, but I'm not good enough to be able to read uh, William James. I'm not that smart. Can't handle it. Tried too many times. Gave that book away quick. You know, it was, it was over my skill set. But I can listen to a lot of talks, and I can listen to a lot of readings. And I, and I picked up a couple of things here, including, uh, including something from, from Kurtz that I've read before to move forward, because I had somebody in my life who needs to hear it today. And I want to pass it forward. I noticed one thing that Sandy was talking about when he sat up here a couple of times, and Sandy, you make reference to it all the time about that thing about Ebby C and Bill and how important that was in our history of Ebby C and Bill. My recollection of, uh, of that uh, thing through AA comes of age is there were three, four times where Ebby saw Bill in that time frame, you know, in, in, at the end of 1934, in that November, uh, December time frame. And here's the thing that always stuck at me. Every time Bill talked about Ebby being there, Ebby was smiling. Ebby was laughing. Ebby had the sparkling eyes. 
You know, and Abby said, are you in one way frame or another? Are you done yet? Have you had enough yet? Are you ready to move on yet? You know, until Bill finally, you know, had his experience. But I think he was beaten on the head for all those, for those four weeks. And those last four weeks of drinking were real four tough weeks of drinking for him. Just like my last five days of drinking were really tough five days of drinking for me to move forward on. Talk a lot about uh, my relationship with my wife. And when I when I get a chance to sit at the podium, one of the things that uh, I used to say was, you know, no matter how much I tried to mess up this relationship with her, that, um, you know, I married someone who loved me more than I was capable of loving. And I meant that for all those years because she's very warm-hearted and loving and big. And something happened about two years ago, I was sitting at a podium just like this. And it reminded me of it today as we took our walk during silent time as I went around to all the stations. Because about two, year, two, uh, about, uh, two years ago at a podium, just about this time, I was sitting there and, and I was giving an AA talk. And I made that, state, that same statement. I stopped. And I started crying. And I said, no, that's not true. I have learned through taking the actions of the 12 steps in my life and being of service to you that I have the capacity and the ability to love at least as much as she has loved me all these years. And I was mindful of that today because um, I've become a crier, even though I went all those decades without crying. And um, I cried uh, when I read to uh, love rather than be loved today. And it was a very warm spot for me to, to feel it. I'm, gonna cl- I'm going to... Um, um, I shared with some guys last night here uh, um, on that same t- on that same topic, and it made me think about it. It was I was at an AA funeral this week, and it was an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous in our community that I was pretty close to. And boy, she kicked my butt. She kicked my butt for many many years. And it was one of those joyful light things. And on the cover of the uh, of the uh, um, um, the, uh, on the cover of the uh, funeral, you know, the, the program, you know, there's a photograph of her, and she, said, and, she, and she said, sorry I had to leave so soon. They needed help setting up chairs. Okay. You know, isn't that what the experience is all about, being in the game, not thinking about the game? You can't take the steps for me. I've got to do them myself. I've got to take the actions for me. You can't, you know, you can't do it for me. I've got to set the chairs up. He's got to turn the mic on. We all got to do the job. Otherwise, it doesn't get done. And through that whole process, Martin, what you were talking about today is, is something that, that's been, uh, that, that is, you know, that God's not lost. He's there. It's up for us to find him. And if I've learned anything from taking the actions uh, of those steps in my life, and I've had the biggest growth opportunities from, uh, from uh, um, doing, study, doing step study work with men, you know, and where we come from, where I come from, and what Bob brought up, I don't know, Bob, 18, 20 years ago, the uh, study guide, you know, from down in Texas, the Dr. Paul study guide the first time, uh, um, where you can sit around and, you know, agree to a format, spend 20 weeks together with a group of men, and take the actions, and um, you know, having a chance to do that, the uh, the, the 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 power and the strength of taking the third step prayer together the first time with a dozen men, you know, as we all know, is powerful. But the most important and strong message that I can leave tonight was I, I spent last year starting out on the first, on the first Saturday of, of uh, the year and went through the first 20 weeks of the year with half a dozen men in my life doing the same thing. And I got all said and done. It was time to schedule. And I, we got in the middle of the inventory process. And after spending four weeks with an inventory process with a group of men, where everything's laying there, and I got all said and done, I called Bob up and I said, you know, um, I think it's time for me to do my fifth step. But, you know, I don't know if it's going to be necessary. And he said, why is that? And I said, because there's nothing new on the damn list that wasn't there two years ago or four years ago. The same people, places, and things are still in the list. There's a lot less today than there was two years ago, and there's less than there were four years ago. But the ones that are there are still the ones that have always been there. And if I've learned anything from my 18 years of sobriety is 
I don't have the power to remove those from the list. I know the actions I need to take. I need to have the courage of the conviction of the experience. I've taken, the, I've taken that leap forward to be able to remove them from the list for the things that I don't have the power to. Thanks for having me out this weekend. Hi, my name's Chris from Tampa, Florida, by way of Park City, Utah, Dallas, Texas, Chicago, Illinois, Indianapolis, Indiana, Syracuse University, Granby, Connecticut, Greenfield, Massachusetts, uh, Stony Brook, New York, East Chautauqua, New York, and so on and so forth. I've been around a lot, been a lot of different places, but I found my home here in Tampa. I'm an alcoholic and a lot of other things, many of them pretty bad, and actually a couple of them pretty good. Um, you know, I'm a... Uh, I'm a husband. <clears throat> um, I didn't know it was going to be a husband <clears throat> again. Um, I'd given up on that one, but I, have, I want to mention this right up front because I have one of the most wonderful wives um, a man can have, and, I, and many of you met him, or him. <laughs> <clears throat> not, <clears throat> not that there's anything wrong with that, but... Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Met her, <laughs> happens to have the same name as me, uh, with a teen at the end, so it's Christine. So if you ever see C1 and C2, I can tell you right now, I'm C2. Um, and uh, looking at this bed, I'm almost tempted to sit down in it because it looks pretty darn comfortable. I'm, I'm so grateful for being here. I, I um, you know, this this uh, this session was something that Sandy uh, came up with, and I remember when we were first walking through the original um, agenda, and Guy had that classic moment of asking Sandy if he could review, if we could do a dry run of what he was going to do during the sessions, and in about a, about a third of a nanosecond, Sandy said no. <clears throat> He said, because I don't know what I'm going to do during those sessions. And, uh, and that's been the truth. And this session, though, was about maestros originally. And, and uh, Sandy had seen a, a, a movie about, um, uh, it was uh, Flamingo Dancers, I believe, in, um, in Argentina. And it was, he was known as the maestro. And so uh, he always likened this, this to, as the one that could dance just flawlessly and effortlessly in a way in which others just um, marveled at. And um, the first two maestros happen to be Scott Redman and Bob Bizance. And they're two of my most wonderful and favorite friends on the face of the earth. And Scott's not with us anymore, but we were even talking today. Um, there's a lot of people that have gone before us and are gone now. Chuck C., um, Jack Quarterman, Keith Lewis, Scott Redman, and many, many more um, that are still with us and a part of the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous and their legend, legend and legacy goes on and they are still saving people today. And uh, that is an amazing, amazing thing to leave behind. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my spirituality. I, you know, my, my story is actually not that interesting, um, I don't think. And Guy would tell you my fifth step was really not that interesting. It took me 12 years to get to it, but um, <clears throat> he was bored, so uh, yeah, it wasn't very, very, very interesting. <laughs> I want to talk about spirituality a little bit because that was really a struggle. You know, I'm a, I'm a Charlie Brown spiritualist. I, I was a Charles Schultz fan as a young kid, and and um, my parents went to um, an Episcopal church on Long Island. It was, gosh, built in the 1600s or something silly like that. And that was the coolest thing I thought about that church, that it, that it had a revolutionary war slug in it. Um, but I didn't understand God at all. But I sat one day and watched Charl uh, the um, Christmas uh, story with Charlie Brown, and Linus went through that talk about, you know, when Charlie Brown screams out, doesn't anybody know what Christmas is about? And that's how I felt. I always felt that way. Don't, don't anybody know how fill-in-the-blank is about? And when Linus got up there and read, uh, I think it was, I had to look it up, Luke 2, I guess, 8 through 14, and um, it just I had chills in my spine. And he walked off that stage just so matter-of-factly, that's it for me. And, um, you know, I was, probably, I, could, I was probably seven or eight, and I just remember I had moments like that. And that's how my spiritual world has worked. And uh, I have a Christian background, but I, it doesn't, that's not, for me, it's, it's, it's still about, 
uh, the journey. And uh, my my spirituality is highly personal, very, very personal. And, and I learned a while ago not to care what anybody else's was. Uh, it's not important to me. Um, it, I've got I've got no argument. And that's one of the things when I came back to my church, um, I asked my minister about it. I said, you know, I, I don't want to argue about any of this stuff. I said, I just want to I just need help understanding because I don't I don't get it. I don't know if any of you had that experience, but that was my experience with God. Um, you know, my mother and father were, were uh, they were good church people, my mom particularly. My dad, um, a wonderful man, a, a drunk, and I came from a history of that. He died of alcohol poisoning at 60 years of age, just dropped dead one night. And um, it was a shock to us, but we didn't talk about it much. I've got um, an, an older brother who just celebrated 22 years. I, I had my last drink on January 1st, 1990. And uh, so we've got a pretty good history in our uh, family of alcoholism. Um, so you'd think I'd know a little bit about it. Um, well, it really wasn't until I got to Tampa that I found out a lot about it. I, uh, January 1st, 1990, I, I, I threw one of those Hail Mary Fox, Fox Hole prayers when I got pulled over after watching a day of football games, uh, and I had spent some time um, uh, for some things I'd done a couple of years earlier that made me think what was about to happen when they pulled me over was about to happen again. And uh, I just said to God, please, please, God, don't send me back there, and, and I'll, ne- I'll never drink again. And, um, and, I, and I, I didn't get go back, and the, and the officer just came up and gave me a warning and sent me home, and, uh, and that was the last drink I ever had. And I, I stumbled into AA about 14 days later, and I was scared to death. Uh, I didn't get it. I didn't like people. I was, I was a runner, and I don't mean the kind that competes when they run. I just ran. And, um, and that was the way life was for me. Um, uh, about that time, my mother got sick. My father had passed away in 1985. Um, suddenly, my, I had gone back to live with my mother, Granby, Connecticut, tiny little one-horse town. And uh, my mom got uh, ovarian cancer. And I got the phone call on one of five kids. And I got the phone call at, uh, at work. And, um, and they said, you know, her biopsy had come back positive, and, and she had ovarian cancer. They called us in to come talk to the doctor. He basically said she's got about three months to live. And, uh, you know, she was 59 years old, 58 years old. And uh, I was living with her at the time, and so I was the natural um, uh, surrogate, uh, medical surrogate. And the oncologist took over, and this guy was amazing. He was an incredibly talented guy, and, and that was when I got my first experience with, with what good, good hospitals, good nursings, and uh, the people that have that gift of being able to keep people alive. My mom lived for two and a half years. Went through five major surgeries. She was all of about 5'2 and about 92 pounds. And uh, I made about $18,000 a year and had five kids uh, a tour and a dog. And, and she showed me uh, the way to live in a dignified life. And the night uh, before she died, I went to go talk to her. And we didn't know, you know, she was back in the hospital again. Went in and out a couple of times. And she was really getting frail. And, and I... Um, I talked to her that night, and I was going to move to Dallas very shortly. I'd gotten a job offer, opportunity to move to Dallas. I kind of had stuck around for a little while, made a deal with my company to stay in Hartford while, while things worked out with my mom. And I went to go see her that night, and um, yeah, I was, not a God, I was not a believer at that point. I, I didn't know what God was. I didn't know what he looked like. or what. I just didn't believe it. I tried all kinds of different uh, theological ways of trying to figure out what religion was and what... What, uh, what God was in my life, but I just didn't feel it. And that night, um, you know, this, this frail little woman, I could see the absolute and utter peace in her eyes. She was 60 years old. And uh, she lost her husband. She had, uh, as I said, five kids. And, uh, and I left her that night, and, and she passed away in the morning. And it took me a while, but there was something magical about that evening. And, and I didn't know it till about 10 years later. Uh, and I was in uh, Chicago, Illinois, and uh, some things weren't going real well. And I, what happened with me right after I stopped drinking was I went to AA, I got scared, I kind of bounced in and out of meetings, I didn't really get it, um, and I just got busy. And, uh, and, and if you're a runner, that's what you do, you just get busy. And you do whatever's in front of you, and you do it as hard as you can, as fast as you can, as far as you can. Um, and it, and it, and it kind of just lets time go by. 
And I went in and out of AA, and I, I knew the book pretty well, but I never really worked the steps too much. In 1998, I had a problem that made me realize, you know, these steps that I'd heard about, which I could talk to you about, which I knew about, which I could share about, I could tell you all about them, I hadn't done them yet. I hadn't had a real sponsor. So there was this guy named Mike. I call him Magic Mike today. It has nothing to do with the movie. He was about five foot four and about 130 pounds and probably in his late 50s. I was in my uh, early 30s, I guess, late 30s rather. And uh, and he got me on a third third step prayer. And uh, and I could, just couldn't get over that one. You know, it worked first two, first two, first two. And I got to that third step prayer and I just didn't know where to go with God. What do I do with God in my life? Do I really believe I can turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him? And he said to me, he said, well, do you think that uh, you are the supreme being of the earth? And, you know, being the incredibly humble man that I was at the time, I said, well, of course not. How could I be the supreme being? And he said, well, do you think that there's something that controls all this stuff? I said, well, I don't know if there's anything that controls it. He says, well, do you believe that it, it was put here for us? I said, absolutely. Actually, I do. That I do believe. And he said, well, there's your God. And he kind of painted me into a corner. And he, I had to admit to him that, yes, I was not I, there was definitely a power greater than myself, and that was the first breakthrough I had when it came to spirituality and understanding of God in my life. Um, shortly after that, I remembered, and I thought about, you know, I thought about my mom a lot. Think about my dad a lot. Still, it's 20, 30 years later, and um, you know that moment where she passed away, and that in such peace and utter comfort, she had no fear in her eyes, she had no concern whatsoever. She was going to wherever we go. And uh, and today that stays with me, and uh, it's just absolutely magical. Um, I was um, I kept moving. I was I was a consultant. I traveled a lot. I, I you know I could work 14 hours a day. I mean, just stuff you do is. Ugh. I wasn't married. I didn't have much dating life going on. And um, but I did stuff. You know, I flew everywhere. You know, so when guy says he never knows where he's going to find me, he's right. You know, I go to the Kentucky Derby, the Indy 500, the Masters Golf Tournament. Never went to the Super Bowl, World Series though. And you know, any sporting event I would show up at, and I would go to the Indy 500, and there's whatever 400,000 people there, and I'd be the loneliest man on the face of the earth. And uh, and I've met a lot of people in AA that have been there. And and at the moment, it's you know, I, I call it living in in the world of next. I'm not in the moment. I don't care what's going on right now. I just want to know what is going to happen next. And the problem is, is you can never catch next. And uh, Scott Redman used to say, uh, fear is not in the present moment. It's only in the future. I'm not afraid uh, you hit me. I'm afraid you are going to hit me. Um, once you've hit me, there's no more fear anymore. There's just pain. And, uh, you know, that, that makes all the sense in the world, right? And, and so I had to learn how to be with uh, spirit in my life that I could be satisfied with and sit and be peaceful with. I went back to, uh, actually I got introduced to a church. I was, I was at that point in 2000. I was actually standing, <laughs> I get to see it every year. I was standing right in front of Macy's on 34th Street. I decided that I had to go see the ball drop because I'd never seen that and uh, I was alone. I wasn't by myself. So again, I don't know, whatever, two million people and me <clears throat> standing in New York City watching that ball drop on 1-1-2000. And I just remember thinking to myself, I am so lonely. I am 10 years without a drink. I'm in and out of AA. I've done some of the steps, but not all of them. I don't have a place to live. Keith Lewis used to talk about having a, uh, a license, uh, a uh, uh, library card. I hadn't had a library card. I didn't have an address. I didn't have a home. I lived in an airline seat. I did my entire life in a one-by-one-foot airline seat. Um, and I didn't have a home, I didn't have a community, I didn't have anything. At the time, I had started uh, working in Tampa. I was in, living in Park City at the time, but uh, I had gotten a project in Tampa. Uh, I'd always wanted to move to Florida. I always figured I love the ocean, I love warm weather. I thought, well, one of these days I'm going to move down to the, the East Coast, live on the ocean, and, and it's going to be great. I went to Tampa, and I was thinking, Tampa. <laughs> It's the east, it's the west coast, it's got to be boring, it's kind of small, you know, why do I want to be here? And I found my home, I found my community. The thing about Tampa that absolutely shocked me and my 
My sponsor, Guy King, is, a, is, is the example I use of this, is there are communities there. There are generations there. That town has been there a long, long time, and a fourth, fifth generation families all over Tampa. So there is a community. It's not transient. It's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, moving people all the time. So I found my place in Tampa. I went to an AA meeting because I had started to get desperate again. I realized I needed to go. Uh, go through these steps. I, I knew I had, you know, it's the back of your mind. You know, I know this stuff. I know this stuff. I'm not drinking. I don't have any desire to drink. I had no desire to drink in that entire period of time. When, when I asked God to have that removed, foxhole or not, it went away. And, um, but I was not living in a, in a, in a really comfortable spot. I'd, I'd gotten relatively successful in business. I'd made more money than I ever thought I was going to make in my life, which wasn't much, by the way, but, uh, but, um, from where I came from, it seemed like a lot, and uh, and I called it the the uh, the light switch effect. When that light switch went out at night, I was not at peace. There was little peace in my mind when the, when I went to bed at night, and it's because I was alone, and I had no, I had not dealt with the programs of Alcoholics Anonymous yet, in a way in which I could live on a day by day basis in a comfortable way. Um, I went back to a church. I got introduced to a, a wonderful minister named Steve Caselli. He's here in Tampa. Um, and I went to him and I said, I don't understand the Bible. I don't understand God. I don't understand theology. I don't understand any of this. Help me, please. I went started going. He, I told him my story. So why don't you go back to AA? I did. started going back to AA on a regular basis. I walked into uh, the Wednesday night Riverside group, meets in, uh, on Bayshore, uh, one of Guy's main groups. Sandy was there. And I said, I need help. I've, I've, you know, bounced around this program for 10 years now, and uh, and I've I've kept in front of it. I've run away, but I know sooner or later I'm going to blow my brains out if I don't stop. And I need I need to understand what is this higher power that Magic Mike had had uh, given me a glimpse of uh, a couple of years earlier. So um, Steve really helped me. He he, you know, I said to him, I said, I don't want to argue about it. I don't want to argue about whether this is right and those people over there are wrong and you can't believe in this because you got to believe in that I said I just I just want some guidance and he he could speak about God in a way no other person could speak to me about God and he gave me that opening door again to start looking at spirituality and, and how to have a relationship with a power greater than myself and then I started uh, working with Guy, and I, I all but begged him to work the steps. And I had had a couple of sponsors. They, they were in and out. They were really hard to get a hold of, and I really was working at this point. I'd, I'd given up on the, you know, I'm going to do two or three, three things you tell me. I was going to do anything you told me at this point. I was utterly desperate. And uh, I went to Guy, and I, I said, would you please sponsor me? He said, I've got about six guys I'm working with right now. He says, you've got to be a little patient with me. I said, patient, I've waited 10 years. I probably can wait a little longer, um, but don't let me go. Please don't let me go. And, uh, and he didn't. And we sat down and went through the steps one a week um, over the course of the next uh, probably better part of six months. And uh, I worked through four and five, worked through eight and nine. Um, and he showed me what the program Alcoholics Anonymous was. In the meantime, I'd, uh, one of the things he said to me, he says, you know, how many meetings are you going to? And I always hated that question. And I said, uh, some. And... Uh, <clears throat> And he said, uh, he said, here's the deal. He goes, uh, if, you're, if you're new and you kind of seem a little new, he said, I go to five a week if you can. He goes, you definitely have to go to three a week. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. And uh, it so happened he didn't bother telling me where to go, and it just so happened there was a gentleman standing outside one night and right down the street, Bayshore Presbyterian Church, and, uh, and I said, Sandy, I said, uh, how do you go to three meetings a week? He goes, well, there's one here Monday night at 7 o'clock, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, Friday night at 8.30, Saturday at uh, 10.30 in the morning, and Saturday night at, uh, at uh, 8 o'clock. He goes, there's a bunch of them, and I couldn't deny it. And that's how I started my relationship with Mr. Beach. And um, the thing about it was, is he said, why don't you go out to dinner afterwards? And I said, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll do that. And uh, I hated the dinner thing. Oh, my God. Is there a chair? Is there going to be a chair for me? Oh, what happens if I show up and there's no chair for me? And so I sweated through that for three months without telling anybody about that fear. And finally, I said to Guy, I said, Guy, I said, there may not be a chair for me when I go to have dinner. And he said, Chris, do you really think you have to be invited? He was an Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't have to be invited. You simply have to participate. And that was the truth for me. And, and uh, you know, this led to uh, 
this led to this. And, and uh, you know, my, we continued to develop relationships. I found a community. I had friends. I had friends in church. <laughs> this shocked me. Um, 250 people. I, I've been there on and off 10 years now. I only have a handful of friends in those church, you know, in that church. And 10 years ago, I would have told you that's unacceptable. 250 people. I should have at least 100 friends. And, uh, you know, but, uh, but nowadays, three or four, five or six is unbelievable. And they're very dear friends and they're good friends. I have the same thing in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they have shown me what God is. And not only that, they have, they have uh, encouraged me to continue to seek and, and to look, uh, look beyond for what, what God's uh, faith is for me. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Far Corners for a little bit, if you don't mind. I, I, um, this has been a really special event in my life. And um, there have been nine of these things. And, um, you know, I, one of these days I'm going to sit down and do statistics on it because I'm kind of a st- statistics guy, but I'm, I'm, I'm also a procrastinator, so I've been thinking about doing it for several weeks and I haven't done it yet. But... Uh, <clears throat> So it's a bad combination, trust me. Um, and uh, but I, you know, I was thinking, just kind of running some numbers in my head. And there's probably been 400 people that have attended this thing. And of those 400 people, there's probably 250 or so that are unique individuals, other than repeats and so forth. And uh, and and it's uh, this. I walk on these grounds, and it's a special experience for me. And I've gone back through the different programs that have been done. And, uh, and the talks that have been given. And it's just been this wonderful evolution of the Far Corners. And I love the idea of seek, uh, uh, seek, seek and you will find. Um, and I, and I, I get that every time I do that, that silent period. And I'm out there walking. Um, you know, lately I've had a lot going on, so I, I haven't had a whole lot of quiet time for myself. I haven't given myself and, and cut out the time that I needed to spend and, and understand how do I get closer to my God. And, uh, and Sandy and I have been talking about that a little bit lately because I haven't been that close to God lately. I've been so focused on other things. And I've been so looking outside to try to deal with the next problem that occurs that I've forgotten that God is with me all the time. And, uh, and it's, you know, I, I, somebody, and somebody recently were, was talking and, and we were talking about, uh, all the horrible things that happened. And I had a friend killed in uh, in 9/11, a childhood friend, and I I just it stuck with me. You know, it just stuck with me. And it's it's one of those, you know, how could God let things happen like that? And and I had a good friend of mine, and he just said, you know, Chris, he said, uh, we live in man's world, and uh, and it's not God's world. God's world is God's world. We're in man's world. And not, not, not everything perfect happens in man's world. And, you know, I've met some unbelievable people in AA. And one thing I can guarantee you is, is every single one of them is a man and none of them are gods. And, uh, and they are all have their imperfections. And that's the beauty of this program. It doesn't matter how much sobriety you have, how long you've been around, and what you've done. You can, the, the reason why these, pro, why these, why these rooms stay full is because we, this doesn't go away. It's not like it's, we stop needing it. Oh, I don't need AA anymore. It's not important anymore. I've, I've got it covered. Thank you very much. I will take it from here. Um, that's how I got here. You know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today if that hadn't happened to me. And now, now I don't want to leave. And the other side of this is, is that um, the Far Corners is an interesting experience because you come here and you go through this 36-hour period or whatever, and I get to, I've gotten to a point on some occasions where I've felt as close to God as I ever, ever had been. And then I drive about two miles down the road and somebody cuts me off. <clears throat> and Chris the man shows back up again in a rapid, rapid circumstance. But I've got about 300 phone numbers on my phone and any time I need to, I can call somebody. And, uh, you know, do I use it all the time? Well, there's, there's the kicker, isn't it? So the question is, is, is how much do you want it, Chris? How comfortable do you want to be? How close to God do you want to be? How much of a service can you be? Um, humility is something that I have found is one of the most valuable assets in Alcoholics Anonymous, and yet I seek it probably 5% of the time, and that's on a good day. Um, 
And yet when I sit back and I think about it, and I know about it now, I mean, back in the old days, uh, humility didn't make sense at all. That was, oh my God. As a matter of fact, I can't even believe that was put in the program. I mean, you walk in the door, it's like, humility, are you serious? We're going to go through that? That's, uh, that has nothing to do with the American way. That will not work in the American model. Um, you, 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 you're not going to get a Cadillac with humility. Trust me, this will not happen. Um, and and it's just, it just didn't make sense. But what I've found is, is that is where the serenity and the quietness can happen is, is when I reach out to somebody else and I get out of myself and I stop worrying about whether how hard my day is going to be or whether I'm going to have an argument with somebody in my office um, or, you know, fill in the, fill in the uh, X. I can think about the future and get all freaked out over financial situations. Housing market can go upside down again. And I mean, just on and on and on and on and on. And yet, uh, Jerry said it so beautifully <laughs> today about work. You know, if I had only known <laughs> after the fact how unimportant work was and how, and how really joyful the rest of life should be. And, uh, and I come to these programs to listen to people give me guidance like that. And I'm so grateful that you're all here. I'm so grateful that you all came. I'm sad this is the last Far Corners, and yet at the same time, you know, we really talked about this months ago. This is, this was the culmination. This is, this is, we've done, you know, we, we, I just, I just put a bunch of names on a piece of paper. Sandy, um, brings this message to us. Um, and it's, and you know, he, we always said, and he always said, Whoever was supposed to be here is going to be here. And there's a guy named Carl right over there, and he called me two days ago. And he said, Chris, I've been on the list for about five, I don't know, eight months now. And he was the first person on the waiting list. He said, do you have any openings? I said, Carl, where are you coming from? He said, Dayton, Ohio. I said, how are you going to get here? He said, I'm going to drive. I said, Carl, if you get here, I will get you in the room. And I had the same experience on the first retreat we ever did with a guy named Steve, Steve Lee. Many of you might know him. He called me two days before the retreat. He said, Chris, I don't know why, he said, but I heard about this thing, he said, and I just feel like I've got to be there. I said, Steve, if you get here, we will get you in the room. And that's what Far Corner is all about. It's not about me reaching out and telling people about it. It's not somebody, uh, it's not somebody, uh, uh, you know, just, just deciding that it's something, uh, that would be cool to do. It's people that have a desire to come and participate in this weekend. And it's something special to me that there's only a small number of people that are here at each retreat. It really adds to the intimacy of it. And, uh, you know, when Sandy was going through everything he was going through a couple of months ago, I'm not going to kid you. It was, uh, for me, a very touch and go period as to what was going to happen with Far Corners. I didn't even want to bring it up. In my own mind, I didn't want to bring it up. Forget about talking to anybody about it. And yet at the same time, I knew this was going to be very special. Um, and I, did, I had no idea what was going to happen. I had no idea how it was going to work out. Uh, I had no idea really who was going to be here. Um, but all I knew was is that on December 14th, 15th, and 16th of 2012, I was going to spend some time in Ellington, Florida, with 61 of the best people I could have ever possibly come up, uh, come in contact with. And the only way I ever would have done that was through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm so grateful for that. Thank you for my sobriety. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.